So here's a question I'm posing before us today. Is it only the original autographs as personally penned by the apostles and prophets that are inspired of God? Or does the inspiration of Scripture also extend to copies and copies of copies of copies and even into the translations? I want to answer that question today. The main idea that I want to convey today and to prove is that God never intended for men to have only the originals of the scriptures. None of which are in existence today, by the way. They don't exist. So it was never God's intention for us not to have his word. He intended that the scriptures be faithfully reproduced in perfect copies and also, I believe, in accurate translations of those copies into other languages. Which, by the way, is the only way for the Lord's command to be executed, to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You know, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. We've got to have the scriptures to do that. It's the only way that the words of the Lord Jesus in Matthew twenty four fourteen could be fulfilled. That this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. That means, by the way, in all languages. And then shall the end come. So, translations are a necessity. God intended, I believe, that the scriptures be faithfully reproduced in perfect copies and also in accurate translations into other languages. And that was actually first demonstrated on the day of Pentecost. When we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 6 through 11, that the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they said, we do hear them speak in our tongues, in our tongues, the wonderful works of God. So God there at the day of Pentecost saw to it that they all heard the, the gospel preached in their own language. And so again, the question is, does the inspiration of Scripture extend to copies and copies of copies and even into translations? And so returning here to 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul says in verse 13, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And that sure applies to those that are, that are propagating this Mandela effect hoax. Paul says, verse 14, But continue thou, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child, Paul says to Timothy, thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And then Paul says, familiar verse, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. There are several things that we need uh, to take note of or to glean from this passage about the inspiration of the scriptures. First of all, I want to make somewhat of a side note. Paul says here, he lays out a fourfold or a fivefold purpose, actually, of the scriptures. He says in verse 16 that the scriptures are profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And then he talks about also how uh, that uh, they're able to make you wise into salvation. I would point out that none of those things are popular. They're listed there in uh, verse 16. None of those things are popular in most churches today. Many preachers brag that they don't emphasize doctrine because doctrine divides people. And so for the sake of unity, we don't want to talk about doctrine in this church. What's that? Amen. It is supposed to divide. Most preachers shy away from reproof, from correction and training in righteousness, uh, meaning preaching out against certain sins, by the way, uh, because that also drives people away. After all, we want to build a big church here and. We don't want to drive people away, decrying their sins to them. And so in this day of apostasy, many professing Christians really don't have much use for the real scriptures anyway, which is why you'll see very few preachers addressing the, the, this issue of the attack on the Bible by the Mandela deception. After all, they don't use the King James Bible anyway. 
Why should they even mention it? Back to the point. In verse 14, Paul tells Timothy to continue in the things that he has learned and has been assured of. Reminding Timothy of from whom and when and where he learned those things. Verse 15, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Timothy had been raised by a godly mother who Paul says taught him the Scriptures from the time he was a child. We read in Acts chapter 16 that Paul and Silas were on Paul's second missionary journey. And on his first stop on the missionary journey there in Acts chapter 16 is where Paul met Timothy. Acts 16 verse 1, Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, and believed. His father was a Greek which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. And so Timothy was already a disciple when Paul found him, having been taught not only by his mother, but actually also by his grandmother. We know that from 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verse 4, where Paul says to Timothy, "...greatly desire, desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice." And I am persuaded as in thee also. So here in chapter 3 then, Paul is calling Timothy to continue in the things that he had learned, not from Paul, but from the Holy Scriptures, as he had been taught by his mother and grandmother, both of whom were Jewish. By the way, for us to continue in those things of what, that we have been taught, we need the Scriptures as well, don't we? We can rest assured that neither Timothy's mother nor his grandmother nor even the local rabbis at the local synagogue there in Derby or Lystra in Asia Minor had the original manuscripts of the Scriptures. They didn't have them. They had copies. And yet Timothy learned about the promise of a coming Messiah, whom he now knew as his Savior and his Lord, from what Paul called the Scriptures, which were copies of copies of copies, by the way. Those were the scriptures, able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So first, we see here that the inspiration of scripture, or what Paul called the inspired scriptures, is not limited to the original autographs. Paul says here that copies of the scriptures, even copies of copies, are also to be deemed as scripture. That means they're inspired of God just as the original autographs are. That inspiration carries over into the copies. Presuming, of course, that not one word is to, be, is to be added to or subtracted from. We need to remember that in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2, God said, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Then also, in Deuteronomy chapter 17, God commanded that copies of the Scriptures be reproduced. And that he said that those copies are just as effective and therefore just as inspired as originals. Talking about when Israel comes into the land and they raise up a king. And he says, Deuteronomy 17, verse 18, And it shall be when he, the king that they raise up, when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes, to do them. Verse 20, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand, to the left, to the end, that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children, in the midst of Israel. In Joshua chapter 8, we read about a copy of the scripture. We read eight, Joshua 8, 32, and he, Joshua, wrote there, uh, upon the stones, a copy of the law of Moses, which he wrote in the presence of the children of Israel. Proverbs 25, verse 1. We read, These are also the Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. He copied them out. So that, that's inspired scripture. Copies. So, in keeping with that principle, of course, Paul says here in 2 Timothy, chapter 3, that copies of the original scriptures are also deemed to be scripture just as much as and they're inspired of God just as much as the original autographs. And they're just as much able to make thee wise unto salvation 
as original autographs. In referencing the scriptures here, which of the written books did Paul consider to be scripture? That's a good question to ask. In Romans chapter 1, Paul declared the prophets to be scripture. He said in Romans 1, 1 to 3, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised before, afore by his prophets in the holy scriptures. So he says that the prophets were holy scriptures concerning Christ, uh, concerning his son, Christ Jesus our Lord, etc. In Romans chapter 4, verse 3, Paul declared Genesis 15 to be scripture. He says, For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. In Romans 9, 17, Paul quoted Exodus 9, 16 and declared it to be scripture. He says, For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. All through his writings, Paul references the scriptures, declaring the Pentateuch, the books of history, the Psalms, and the prophets, all to be scripture. In Romans 15, verse 4, familiar verse, Paul says, For whatever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. By the way, Paul even refers to Luke's gospel as scripture. In 1 Timothy 5.18, he says, For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. By the way, corn, not grain. And it says, And the laborer, the laborer is worthy of his reward. I submit to you that the only other place in the entire Bible where we read that the laborer is worthy of his reward is in Luke chapter 10, verse 7, where the Lord Jesus said, In the, sa in, in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his hire, Jesus said to his disciples as he sent them out. Peter also referred to the writings of Paul as scripture. In Second Peter chapter 3, verse 15 to 16, Peter said, An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom God, uh, to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Verse 16, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, Peter said. Paul wrote about some things hard to be understood. Then he said, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, or they twist, as they do also the other scriptures, Peter says, to their own destruction. Peter says that twisting Paul's words to say something that they do not say is a very dangerous thing to do. Because Paul's writings are just as inspired as the other scriptures, says Peter. So we better be careful, by the way, when we cite to Paul's writings or any other scripture, when we try to draw conclusions that are not supported by what the writer was saying. Peter says, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Very early on, actually, the early churches held the Revelation and the Epistles of John, the Epistles of Peter, the four Gospels, the writings of James and Jude, also to be Scripture. Thirty-one times throughout the Gospels, the Scriptures cited to by the Lord Jesus and by the writers include the Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms. The Lord Jesus also declared the Law, Prophets, and the Psalms to be Scripture in uh, Luke 24. This is when, on the road to Emmaus there, when he met the two disciples after his resurrection. He said, verse 25, Jesus said, then said he unto them, O fools, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? We read in verse 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then down in verse 44, we read, and he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Verse 45, Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the Scripture. So Jesus says here that the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms are all Scriptures. So that when Paul said to Timothy that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, he means the entire canon of Scripture that we have in all 66 books of the Old and New Testament. 
And he tells Timothy that faithful copies thereof, which must then include copies of copies of copies, faithfully transmitted word for word and word by word, and nothing added, nothing taken away, nothing changed or subtracted, are also to be deemed to be Scripture and are just as inspired of God as the original autographs. Turn to Psalm chapter 12, please. Psalm 12, and contrary to the purveyors of modern heresy, it was the actual words, the pure words of God that were inspired, not just the thoughts or what the modern Bible changers think may have been God's intention or his thoughts that allows them to paraphrase God's words. God says in Isaiah 55, verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. So puny man has no business trying to interpret what God's thoughts are. We're just to translate or to copy word for word, word by word. It is the very words of God that are to be carefully copied and preserved, not the thoughts. And that's why David said in Psalm chapter 12, verse 6, the words of the Lord, not the thoughts, the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. David says God's words are pure words. And that means, by the way, that God's words are without error. They're inerrant. They're perfect. So that whenever God spoke through his prophets, his holy men of old, as Peter called them, uh, God always said exactly what he meant to say, and he meant exactly what he said. And he moved those holy men of old, that Peter talked about, to speak or to write exactly what he wanted them to speak or to write. As mentioned a few weeks back in the message, The Great Mystery of the Ages, quite often those holy men of old that wrote God's words did not fully understand the words that they were being given to write. Peter reveals this fact when he says in 1 Peter 1, 10 to 11, that the prophets had inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Peter says there that the prophets wrote down things that they did not understand about a gospel dispensation that was yet to come. He doesn't say of whom they inquired of or where they searched. No doubt they searched the law and the other prophets and the Psalms by prayer and supplication. But they were not given the full understanding and meaning of the words that they were given to write, which, of course, gives actually further evidence or proof that the scriptures were inspired by verbal dictation, that every word written down in the scriptures were the words that God gave those prophets to write. The words of God are pure words. As silver tried in the furnace of earth purified seven times. And that phrase, pure words, there is plural. By the way, it's not just one word. It's not, not the word of God is pure. It's his words, all of them. Plural, it means all of God's words are pure, perfect, undefiled, and inerrant, not just some of them. And that's again why God the Holy Ghost says in the Old Testament, confirmed by God the Son in the New Testament, that man cannot live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. All of God's words, every one of them are perfect, pure, undefiled, and inerrant, and must therefore be copied and translated as such. David says, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Seven times, of course, being the number of perfection seen throughout the scriptures. The picture here is of silver being passed multiple times, seven times through a refining fire to purge all the dross and to produce perfect silver that has no impurities. Some KJV only advocates, as we know, interpret Seven times there is actually being seven major translations that the Bible went through uh, from the Greek, from the Texas Receptus into the English language. I don't necessarily agree with that conclusion. I would see the phrase as having a much less limited and a far more comprehensive and eternal meaning than that. I mean, it can also mean when those words are translated into Spanish. So it simply means that God's word is perfect. God's words are pure. They're as pure as the purest silver that you can get. That's what he means there. Verse 7 then says, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation 
forever. God said he will preserve his perfect words. Verse 7 here is not just a hopeful statement or an assertion uh, that the psalmist David there publishing the songbook for the Levites to sing because God is good and he'll preserve his words. This is not just a hopeful statement by, the, by David. This is a declaration and promise of Scripture from God himself who moved David to write exactly what he wanted David to write, that his words are perfect, and further, that he will preserve them forever from David's generation and forever. And again, the Lord Jesus confirmed that promise in Matthew 24, 35, that heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. So then, the words that Jesus said would not pass away in Matthew 24, verse 35, are the same words that he spoke of in Luke 24, 44. Everything written about me in the law of Moses and prophets in the Psalms. Those are all his words. And those words then also include every word that he spoke in his teachings as recorded throughout the Gospels. And it also includes revelation he gave the Apostle John, the scriptures that he directed Paul and Peter to write, and James and Jude as well. Every word of every book in the Bible is to be included in what David referred to as the words of the Lord that Jesus also confirmed would be preserved forever. So, but the question then is, does all this apply to the translations? Specifically, does this principle of inspiration and preservation also apply to the King James Bible? I would say that the Bible also declares that faithful and accurate translations of God's words carry the same inspiration as the originals and are just as inspired and authoritative as the originals. As already mentioned, as was first demonstrated, demonstrated on the day of Pentecost, when we read in Acts 2, 6 to 11, that the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they said, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So it's clear from that passage that it was God's intention that his words be translated into other tongues as enabled by the Holy Ghost, as the Holy Ghost gave them utterance to do so. That was guided by the Holy Ghost. And then also, we see many places in the Bible where translations of God's word are still deemed to be scripture and can be fully trusted to be scripture. For instance, Ezra, chapter 4, 7 through 12. In the days of Artaxerxes, wrote Bishlam, Mithridath, Tabil, and the rest of their companions, and to Artaxerxes, the king of Persia. And the writing of the letter was written in the Syrian tongue and interpreted in the Syrian tongue. Rahim the chancellor and Shimshai the scribe wrote a letter against Jerusalem to Artaxerxes, the king, in this sort. Down in verse 11. This is the copy of the letter that they sent unto him, even unto Artaxerxes the king. Thy servants, the men on this side of the river, at such and such a time, be it known unto the king, etc., etc. So Ezra records here, as inspired scripture, this letter that he translated from Syrian into Hebrew. In Acts chapter 22, 1 through 22, where Paul was assaulted there by the mob in Jerusalem, we read that he spoke to them in the Hebrew tongue. In Acts chapter 22, verse 1 through 3. Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense which I make now unto you. Verse 2. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence. And he saith, verse 3, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day, etc., etc. So here then in Acts chapter 22, Luke translates Paul's Hebrew words into Greek as part of what must be considered inspired scripture. So we see another inspired translation here. And there are many other examples in the scripture where we are given a translation from one language into another, and where the final product remains God's inspired words, the word of God. That is especially true of each and every time the Old Testament Hebrew is quoted in the New Testament by, various, by the Lord Jesus, by the various writers, thereby always being a translation of the Hebrew into the Greek, losing none of the original 
inspiration of the Hebrew from the Old Testament. That inspiration carries over into the Greek. Doesn't, doesn't lose a bit. And each time, uh, remaining in the Greek, the inspired words of God in a new language. Which I submit is actually one of several reasons, perhaps, that the Lord saw fit to send His beloved Son in the fullness of time, as God, as Paul says in Galatians chapter 4, after the Greek language had become the prevalent uh, and common language of the empire, the Roman Empire, in order to show that his word can be translated into the common language of the empire, be it the language of the Roman Empire or of the British Empire, without losing one iota, pun intended, of the original inspiration and the original power of the words themselves. Today's PhDs and theologians say that you cannot perfectly translate across languages. Something is always lost. But the Bible itself loudly and clearly says that's not true. And if you have an accurate word-for-word -word translation of the original text, you've lost nothing and you now have the same inspired scriptures in a new language. If that translation is accurate, word-for-word, word-by-word, it is not a newly inspired double-inspired or re-inspired Bible. It simply carries the inspiration of the original words over into the new translation. Amen. And so then, I believe the principle is pretty firmly established. That if God's words, without anything added or taken away, are translated into another language, they're still God's words. They're still God's words. They're still Scripture. And are still God's inspired words in that language. And it is God's intention that this be done, that his pure words be translated into other tongues. Again, this is the only way the Lord's command to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every preacher and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. It's the only way that can be executed. So the King James translators actually also spoke of this necessity themselves in their very lengthy preface to the 1611 edition of the King James Bible. Here's a very brief excerpt from that. They said, But how shall men meditate in that which they cannot understand? How shall they understand that which is kept close in an unknown tongue? As is written, Except I know the power of the voice, I shall be to him that speaketh a barbarian. And he that speaketh shall be a barbarian to me. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14. They said, Therefore, as one complaineth that always in the Senate of Rome, there was one or other that called for an interpreter. So lest the church be driven to the like exigent, it is necessary to have translations in a readiness. Translation it is that openeth the window to let in the light, that breaketh the shell that we may eat the kernel, that putteth aside the curtain that we may look into the most holy place, that removeth the cover of the well that we may come by the water, even as Jacob rolled away the stone from the mouth of the well by which means the flocks of Laban or water, etc., etc. They spoke a lot about the need necessity for the translation because they wrote that preface to defend their translation from what they would they knew were going to be the attacks of Rome. And so that's why they wrote that very long preface, which is good reading. You should read it, by the way. Further, the King James translators, fully cognizant of the principle of Romans, excuse me, of Psalm 12, 6 through 7, that it is every word, every word of God that is pure. And that it, is, that it is to be preserved. That's why they were painstakingly careful to translate the entire Bible word for word and word by word. They fully understood that they were not to be paraphrasers or expositors. They were careful only to translate God's pure words. And when they added words to clarify the meaning in English, they always were careful to put such words in italics to convey exactly and precisely how they did indeed translate word for word and word by word. So don't let anyone fool you into thinking that God's inspired words are only in the originals. If God's words, without anything added or taken away, are translated into another language, they're still God's words, they're still Scripture, and they're still God's inspired words in that new language. And so it is with the pure words of the King James Bible through which I believe we do have a fully accurate translation of God's words from the Greek and Hebrew into our language, which therefore carries the same inspiration as the original, 
since it neither adds to nor takes away from the original. And I believe we therefore have every right and reason to believe that God himself will honor his promise to preserve his words as faithfully translated in the King James Bible from this generation and forever and beyond the day when heaven and earth will pass away. So then, I believe actually that should sufficiently debunk and refute the main premise that's argued actually both by the Mandalites and also by the textual critics that the, that the principle of inspiration and preservation does not apply to the King James Bible, as they say. We do not worship the King James Bible as we are accused of by these people. However, we are so grateful and we rejoice in the knowledge that through the King James Bible we can rest in knowing that we do indeed have the pure words of God in our own language. Amen. Albeit a slightly more historic version of our language than most people are accustomed to today, uh, or that today's public school dropouts have the vocabulary to understand very well, unless they go to a good church where a good Bible teacher will do as Ezra did, and the Levites of old did, and just read the Scriptures and give them the sense. We do rejoice in that knowledge that God has given us His words and will preserve them. Oh.